All right, welcome everyone to the January 2024 FM Disc meeting. Um, I'm Lynn Allen, member of the board and coordinator of this meeting. Uh, we're trying something new this time. Closed captions are now available. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be an option for you to show the captions. Um, and uh, I've been reading them during the pre-meeting conversation. And mostly they're pretty good with the occasional uh, really hilarious translation. So um, give them a, a try. Um, we, I want to make a note, there is no February meeting this year because of Clarice and Gage, um, which is next month in, I think it's Austin, Texas. I'm sure Rosemary can clarify for us. Um, and we will return in March. Uh, Chris Moyer will be the uh, host that month. So, um, Randy, uh, are you ready? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm a quick announcement. I'm Randy Lawrence, a longtime LA-based developer and FM Disc member. And I'm sad to announce our colleague, Michael Frankel, passed away yesterday. Mm. Michael was part of the core LA-based group that until COVID was FM Disc for the most part. Uh, I always felt an affinity with, for, with Michael. We just clicked. Uh, when we were at the same dev cons, we, we hung out and had a lot of common views on things. And he survived by his wife, two children, and his brother. And he will be missed. Yes. Thank you. So thank you for speaking to that, Randy. Um, we have a really good meeting today. Uh, we have the one housekeeping thing is during the presentations, we're gonna ask that you mute yourself if you're not actually asking a question, just to reduce the background noise. Um, if you uh, hit your space bar, it disables the mute so you can speak without actually unmuting yourself if you hit your space bar. So, um, if you, anyone has an announcement after our breakout rooms, uh, message me privately. I'm in charge of looking at the chat and passing questions in and all sorts of good things. So our first presentation is from Kevin Frank, our good friend from North of the Redwood Curtain. And uh, he's gonna be talking about um, layout calculations and libxl which sounds exciting to me so kevin if you will take it away okay is it up to me to share my screen is that what yes doing? yes you should be enabled to share a screen now there you go okay well uh <laughs> hi uh i'm kevin frank and uh let's hang on a sec there we go. I'll be presenting on two, so it's two, really two mini presentations, layout calculations and live Excel. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, there is a resource page for this presentation on FileMaker Hacks. You can see the URL at the bottom of the screen and I'll show that again in just a minute. Um, so I think a lot of you know me, I've been uh, working with FileMaker since the late 1980s. Um, I'm the technical lead on Codence's Genesis Transactions product. I have a blog called FileMaker Hacks. And uh, again, there's the uh, resource page for the presentation. And uh, that's almost all the PowerPoint we're gonna see today, good news. Um, one other thing though is I did wanna um, sort of do a problem statement. Okay, so layout calcs, what are they and why should we care? Um, so these basically, I think we've all been finding ways to do this for a long time. We might use button bars, uh, invisible button bar segments that don't do anything. We might have scripts that populate merge variables and place these on the layout. So now we have an explicit tool that allows us to do this. And uh, I think uh, I'll just real quick show a, uh, an example of doing it with button bars. Um, 
And of course, one fun thing about button bars was you'd see the word calculation when you would do this. So here, here are about 50 button bars on this layout and uh, each of them is has a definition. Each of them set to do nothing because these are strictly for presentation. Um, and uh, actually a few of them are clickable uh, to run scripts. But so the way this worked was you'd click this and then you'd say, here's what I wanna see on this report. And uh, the button bars would behave accordingly. And if I instead said, no, actually, I only wanna see January and April, you see what's happening, right? You get the idea. Okay, so that was how we did it with button bars. And, um, but now we have layout calculations. We can do this directly. So um, I purposely uh, put some repeating fields on here because uh, some of the nuances uh, involve repeaters. Um, and, but at the most basic level, uh, what we can do in layout mode is, uh, I'll just take that out for a second. And we can say, uh, there's actually three ways to create them. One is uh, start with the text tool, click where you want your layout calculation and say, insert layout calculation. Uh, Shift command C, if you wanna do it from the keyboard on the Macintosh. And I can't remember what the window shortcut is, so I won't attempt to say it. Um, but you could, in, you could do it from here. Let's start with that. Up pops the dialog and, uh, we get in here and we might type something like this. Hello, get username. And actually, so I just realized that's the, uh, that's the actual calc syntax. So what I might do instead is say that. So now I've got a combination of static text and dynamic, dynamically derived information. We click OK, puts it in like this, and you'll notice uh, it's like a basically like a block of merge text, except it's got this italic F. And you can do that you, on the Mac. You can do that with Option F. You can create that character by holding on the Option and pressing F. And um, there's a couple other ways to do it. I think uh, char402 will do it. Um, and on my blog, I have a list of how to produce it, or a, a, I have how to produce it from the keyboard in Windows on my blog. Um, so it's here. We go into browse mode, and there it is. So a couple interesting things are going on here. And I'm actually gonna just show one thing, a behavior change from FileMaker 19 to 20. Here we are now in 19. And uh, here I am, I'm in layout mode and uh, I could have certainly made this larger, but uh, it's we've got the word hello here. And if I try to shrink that block up, when I let go, it's gonna snap back down. And if I try to bring it over like this, at first it looks like, okay, you want to make it smaller, you can. But when I let go, yeah, yeah. it resizes the block. Yeah. And that's the way it's been for a long time. Correct. Okay, so we're done with 19. Come back to 20. If we do the same thing in 20, it's perfectly fine now to size that block smaller. Yeah. However, uh, you need to leave it, it will not auto expand. So you need to leave it large enough to display what's gonna show in browse mode, okay? So like, that's not gonna cut it, right? So you think, okay, great. Now I've, now I've taken care of this. Um, however, that's a, remember this is get username. I'm making an assumption about that username, right? So. If I were to come in here and change my username, then it's not all gonna fit. So I think the idea is that you need to make this big enough to accommodate the largest username you could ever possibly have. Okay, you get the idea. Um, so, now, I do want to point out about this. 
what I did here was one layout calculation. Did you see that? It starts here and it ends here. And there's nothing wrong with embedding multiple separate uh, functions or whatever inside your layout calc. But there is another way you could do it. So we're moving on to basic example two. This uh, has this, you know, let me uh, reset, reset my username to Kevin. All right. Kevin? Yes. We had a question about turning on sample data. Oh, that would be interesting. So here I am in, yeah, there you go. So we're still in layout mode, but we're seeing sample data. Okay. It was the question just that what happens when you do it? Basically, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So now I'll point out, now it's a standard merge block, but I've chosen to uh, insert two separate layout calcs within that. And there are some advantages to doing that. Um, and, uh, but before I even get to that, I'll just point out, if I just click on the block as a whole, and now I control click on it, we've got edit layout calculation. Um, let me see if that's available from here also. It's also available from here. And of course, it's also available from here. Oh no, that's going to put a new one in. Okay, let's go. Let's go with let's go with the context menu. So if I just click on the block as a whole and I say edit layout calculation, it's going to give me the first one, right? Because remember, I've got two layout calculations in this block. But if I instead um, click inside the one I want, in this case, I'm inside this one, anywhere in there, and say edit layout calculation, then it's going to give me that one. And the, um, let's see, the knowledge base article or the engineering blog article, uh, I don't think has been updated since 20.3 came out because layout calcs were introduced in 20.2. And so it says only the first 10 calculations can be edited using the context menu, but I, I never tested that before. But when I test it now, I've now got one block that has 16 layout calcs in it. And if I click in the 16th one and say edit layout calculation, there's the 16th one. So I think that no longer holds true. Um, let's see. So another thing that we could do is, um, we could actually, for the first time, put a calc inside our standard, this isn't a button bar, this is just a standard button, could actually put a calc inside there. And we could do it um, right here. We can type the raw syntax. Right. So this is something we haven't been able to do before. Another thing that I haven't shown yet is we can also edit directly on the surface. We don't need to use that dialog at all. The dialog is really helpful. Um, the that you get when you say insert layout calc because then you've got the full parsing power of the calculation engine. But you can also throw caution to the wind and simply come in here and edit this thing directly. In fact, you can completely create it from scratch. All right. So you can couple of angle brackets, option F, right? And that's a perfectly valid layout calc, okay? Um, any questions so far? You used to write your HTML from scratch, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> I've been known to, yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay. So there's some interesting things going on here. One is, um, I per one of the reasons I wanted to go with repeaters was to show um, a, a little nuance in behavior. And some people aren't aware of this to begin with, but here I've got three different things based all based on this. The first is 
rep one, rep two as standard merge fields. And we go into layout mode and sure enough, there they are, just what you would expect. And they both show. Now I'm gonna run a script and this script, it has now populated uh, two variables. Text with rep one and text two with rep two. But it turns out that merge variables don't support repetitions. And that's, a, that's well documented. It works as expected. It's not a bug. That's just a, the fact that with merge variables, you can only specify the first rep. You can try, but you will not succeed if you do that. So what's cool is with layout calcs now, you can put that mer that higher repetition of the variable into the layout calc and it works fine. So another thing I wanna point out is there was a subtle behavior change. Let's see, hang on a sec. Yeah, there was, this, there was a subtle behavior change um, in 20.3 versus 20.2. And here's how it works. Let's say I'm gonna put a new, let's just gonna, let's just put a new land calc on here. Okay. And um, I decide to reference a field. Okay. So what it gives you is the field. It does not give you the fully qualified field. Notice we don't have a demo colon colon in front of that. In 20.2, if I double click this, it would have done this. So if we go into layout mode here, you'll see that we've got exactly the same layout calc once standard with the current behavior and once fully qualified. And it turns out there's several good reasons to stick with the fully qualified version, even though you don't get that out of the box now when you double click on fields in the uh, manage uh, calc definition. And um, one is pretty obvious, and that's that if you decide to look at this in the data viewer, this will resolve, All right? Sorry, no matter where I move the zoom bar, it's always in my way. All right, so. Right. That will resolve. But if I took the other version or say I'm, you know, copy it out of there and want to debug it in the data viewer, that is not going to resolve. Okay. So since they need to be fully qualified in the data viewer anyway, that's that's one good reason. Another reason to make them fully qualified is you might have some users in still in 20.2, and this will not display as a layout calc in 20.2. So they must, but the third reason is actually the most compelling. So here I am, I'm back in browse mode. And you'll notice uh, here they're identical. But if we um, start to change text, now I've edited this and notice down here, we've got the fully qualified version and up here we don't, as soon as I tab out of the field, notice this was instantly responsive. This one hasn't responded yet. Um, And even if I click on the background, the upper one doesn't. I have to do something that really forces a refresh, like click refresh window or toggle the mode. Now I just clicked refresh window and it did update. So um, I would say best practices, stick with fully qualified field names in your layout calcs. Now, something that's uh, changed in 20.3 also was that when you um, have a layout calc, you now can set the result type. And at first I was all excited about that because I was thinking it would give us some kind of extra power or something. It turns out there doesn't seem to be any practical value to doing this at this point. I don't know if they're embedding something that will come to fruition in a future version or what. So um, it seems like it should be useful for the same reason that you'd want to set the result type on a standard calculated field. But in practice, it turns out to not make any difference. So I'm gonna recommend leaving this on text. And if you think I'm wrong, um, please prove me wrong because I've tried and I've discussed it with a lot of our colleagues and no one can come up with a 
valid, valid reason to change it. So um, for example, it has nothing to do with the formatting, it has absolutely, I repeat, nothing to do with this formatting. Um, so hang on one sec, let me check my notes for a sec. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, what else did I want to say about that? Layout calc inside the text block, one big layout calc. Yeah, let's see. So if I do this, let's see what that's going to do. Oh, right. Okay. So I'll just point out here, what I've got is a standard text block, then it has a standard merge field. And then I've put the layout cap down here, including it's doing some math, right? So whereas here, it's all in one big layout calc. So now this has text and a date component. And what I found was just like we used to do with button bars or any when we were doing merge letters or anything like that, it's really helpful sometimes to just stay in completely in text mode, don't even bother with the formatting and just use a custom function. Uh, Tim Mansour wrote one called Format Timestamp. It's absolutely amazing for doing making it as granular as you could ever want it to be and still keeping it text. So um, that that's a good one to have in your toolkit. And let's see, are there any questions at this point? All right. Um, there's a wonderful article about layout calcs on the beeswax blog. Um, and uh, Alec Gregory is the author. And I picked up a pretty cool trick from him from there. And that's, um, so here I've got one date and I wanted to show it in a single layout calc, but have it formatted all the different ways. So the problem is just if we go into layout mode, Obviously, on a, on a single block, you can only have one date format. So the question is, what's going on here? And it turns out what's going on is I've got four merge fields pointing at date field. And I happen to use merge fields. I didn't try it with a standard field, so I'm not going to embarrass myself and experiment right now. But... Um, and they're named D1 through D4. And each of these has the date formatting applied here in the inspector. And for the ISO, I did a custom and just pushed it through like that. For this Your one. month day. Exactly. Exactly. Separated by hyphens. Well, that's so, really nifty, Kevin. Yeah, I got that from Alec Gregory's blog article. And so Can you mix in a, um, well, I guess that wouldn't work since they're all deriving from the same date field, but could you mix in like a currency um, format for a separate number field? Oh, absolutely. You can make this do whatever you want in here. But the cool, so the cool thing is I was imagining you're offline, you don't have access to custom functions, right? You don't want to take the time to write, you know, because you could obviously do all that manually in the calc engine if you wanted to. So um, now those are standard, but what if, uh, let's look at the next example. What if you wanted to actually do some math, like in this case, you wanted to add this number to this date. And it turns out that's fine. Put your, put your layout calcs over here, apply the same formatting, name them the same. That works too. So um that's really about all i've got for this presentation so if there's any questions before we move on to live excel kevin yes um on the previous example using a custom function did i was i right in seeing that the custom function parameters were in square brackets yeah but that that's just the internal syntax used by the custom function that's a convention okay. Oh, okay. It's nothing to do with how layout calculations use the parameters then. Not at all. Those okay. that's just for um file manage custom functions. Yeah, so Tim Mansour wrote this. If if you grabbed it a long time ago, he's he's 
updated it fairly recently. So it's a little more flexible than it used to be. Um, and on the resource page, I'm linking to my blog articles and my um, second blog article on layout calcs has a link to this, to the, or you can just find it on Brian Dunning's website format timestamp. Okay. You know, there is one other thing I wanted to point out. This is subtle. Okay. But let's go back to something that has multiple. Uh... Okay. So here's, here's a little block with two layout calcs. And I don't know if this will be really obvious, but if I click in here and say edit layout calculation, while I'm doing that, it's highlighting what it's editing. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's about all I have to say on that subject. Hey, Kevin. Uh, this, yes. The, this is Vince. One, one question. Go back to one of your larger calculations that you have. Okay. So, um, Hang on maybe, one the, maybe the last, yeah, maybe, yeah, I'm this one here. Can you make it really small? Sure. Um, sure. Hang on one sec. Miss? I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah. So making it yeah. really small. So like, let's yeah. say this one. Yeah. You make it like one line. Okay. okay. Let's say that, let's say that's what you want. Right. Um, it, now go to browse mode. Right. And so I predict we're just not going to see it. Right. Because it won't expand. Right. 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 Okay. Now go back to layout mode. Yes. Now click on it and change the font. On just like there? No, no, no. Uh, just on just the whole block. Right. Yeah, just go ahead and change the font. Yeah, that's the problem. It Good resizes the block. Good to know. Yeah. But yes. that's with that's been with layout text objects since oof. Right, but they've they've now done it so that if you resize the block, it doesn't it it respects your resize, but if you change the font. It'll blow. It'll blow the size out again, and so you'll have to resize it to the way you had it. Which mm -hmm. is, especially if you have a large calc and you want it, and you and you have a large calc that renders like just a you know like some stat number or something, right? And uh, you just want it really small. You don't want it to be big. Changing the font will will screw up your layout, especially if the part if the the object is in a body part. It'll 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 enlarge the body part to fit it and everything. So you've got you know like oh man, I don't want that. So, <laughs> right. So we could yeah. in theory resize your your layout body part. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Hey, ben, um, Vince, did Vince ever had do that before? Uh, yeah. Got her hand yeah up. But what I'm yeah what I'm pointing out is that it should not do that because it's now respecting the size that you give it. So it seems like a bug to me. Uh, so, so I still have the problem from a long time ago. We just have some better controls that it ignores. Um, Beverly had a up. question. Okay, Beverly. Yeah, it, it kind of goes along with what Vince was saying, but I think you can still select that first angle bracket and do your styling on that and it's honored. Absolutely. It's just we don't need to anymore. But you're, oh, you're I, yeah. I know, but but that yeah. prevents that from resizing the entire block because you're only <laughs> styling that first angle bracket, right? All right. So hang on. So if I take this and drop that to six, yeah. Then we expect it will look the same in browse mode, right? Just 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 like the good old days, right? I was thinking we'd never have to do this trick again because now we can do this, right? And this isn't a good example, but you, right? But we get, so is your point now that we've done this, I should be able to change the font and not lose the? No, no, I'm not saying change the font of the block. I'm saying change the font of that angle bracket only so that uh -huh. it's not resizing the block other than that one little character. All right, let's see. Well, it didn't, it did not force the block to resize, but I think we expected that that would be the case, right? Okay, well, I, I didn't know that. Like okay. Vince's point was that if you change the font, it resizes the block. But if you change just that first character, it only 
only makes that a larger font without resizing the block. Mm -hmm. um, Sean had a question as well. Hi, Sean. I was just going to make a comment that um, I've seen some weird behaviors using layout calcs in portal rows where like if you go to go back in to double click into that calc or edit something it expands the size but then that like makes it too big for the portal and puts it down a lot lower on your layout and you can lose the object Ooh. you know it's still in in your object palette on the left you can find it but it like there's no way to click on it because it's still contained in the portal but it's moved way down it, it's weird but just something to be aware of <laughs> yeah you know another gotcha is um this this i just remembered when these first came out um i used layout calcs uh the uh the client was an early adopter and uh we used them uh for pdf generation but he decided to do the pdf generation server side and he suddenly contacted me. He goes, hey, uh, work you did is no good. I'm just getting garbage on the output. And I said, what's your version of FileMaker server? He says, 20.1.2. And I said, it needs to be 20.2.1. So the point was, like, you would think, oh, this is just a UI thing. I don't need to worry about my version of server. But in that particular instance, we did. So, All right. On that happy note, shall we... Yes, move, let's move on let's, to your, is move. it lib or lib? Excel? I have no idea. I say lib. Because <laughs> okay. to me, it's a library. Um, but, uh, okay, well, um, similarly, I put together this little sort of problem statement. Why, why should we care, right? Because I think we've all wanted at one point or another, have had client requests, uh, to produce Excel spreadsheets programmatically. And what's neat about this is it's not just, oh, I can tweak the appearance of the spreadsheet after I've done an export. It really is like a magic wand and virtually anything you could do in Excel, you can do now from within FileMaker. So um, I'm gonna uh, actually start out sort of demonstrating the problem if you will. Okay, so just I'm just going to talk a little bit about the architecture of this demo. Um, sales data, but let's look at the graph. There's four tables here. And the uh, we've got sales, customers, types, and states. So what's in the uh, sales table, right? These three fields our actual data in the table. And then we've got uh, these keys pointing to these other things. And if once we have the customer ID, it can reach over to the grandchild and get the name of the state if we wanna see the name of the state. Um, because uh, in the customer, we just have the two letter abbreviation of the state. Um, discard that. So if we wanted to produce uh, a spreadsheet, maybe that looked like this, let's see. Excel takes a little while to load sometimes on this machine, but it will get there. Yeah, so if we wanted to produce something that looked like this, um, this was actually done with the plugin, but let's, let's, say this was, let's say this was our goal, right? There are various tricks one could do, but I just wanna point out that out of the box, so just sort of generic, uh, raw export let's go with uh, excel let's tell it to open yes you can replace we don't care about that so i would grab some of the fields locally and i would grab some of the fields from uh, related tables set up my export order click export it's something that looks like this, uh, including Excel helpfully right flushing the date, um, but not the field names we'd want our end users to see, right? Now, I don't know how many of you 
have uh, attempted to work around that problem. And uh, Beverly came up with an amazing way where you effectively make HTML, but you rename it XLSX and, uh, and that works. And I documented that many years ago in FileMaker Hacks. There's other ways to go about it. The ugliest and simplest way would be um, to simply define some helper fields like that, that echo the data, All right? And then when you go to do the export, you would just specify those. And when you do that, then at least you get something that has the, oh, by the way, and I made the result type text there to, to get that to force left. So that can be done. Um, although I don't think any of us relish the prospect of creating lots of helper garbage helper fields in our tables to accomplish that. So um, in terms of the plugin that is talking to live Excel, well, let me actually jump back just for a second and uh, talk about What's going on here? There's sort of several layers to this, right? One of the of the layers would be Live Excel itself. Okay, so this is an Excel library that um, lots of different pieces of software have licensed, and it turns out um, Nick Orr leveraged it uh, for his FMXL plugin, and that's what I chose to use here, but if you're a monkey bread user, um, there's also an Excel add-on for monkey bread. And uh, documentation is really nice here. So even if you're using Nix, you might come over here and take a look at the documentation. Sometimes there's a slight variation. You can't just copy and paste it, but it's often when you get in and take a look, it's close enough. So really nice documentation here. In terms of what you get with the Goya plugin, um, actually, let's do this you get um, well, one thing you get is a test file, okay? And one nice thing about the test file is you can run the scripts and then you can look at the output. So like here now we're making something that doesn't really look like it's just an, an export from Excel. So this was produced programmatically and I'm not gonna get into the guts of that because I have my own demo to show, but um, but I will point out that if you wanted to see it, you would just come in here and take a look at the contents of the script. But, um, another thing that he has, let's see if I have it on my recents. Uh, yeah, that's it. Another thing that Nick has is a hosted file. And so you sign in as guest. And this is linked to off of his page. And then uh, we've got our master detail here. And so we come over here and we click and we can take a look at these functions this way. Book, save, book, uh, add sheet. There we go. In some cases, he's got some helpful descriptions here. One of the things you can do in here is you can say search, just show me things that are, um, sheet Excel that are sheet functions, right? So um, this is read only, you can't mess it up, but you can search it and use it as a resource. And um, so the first thing that I wanna do is circle back around to that little, this this here and say, okay, what's going on here? What did, uh, how, how did this get created? So let's see. Um, so to produce this, right, uh, with Live Excel script, and this file is, is available uh, to download and play with. Uh, also, I am going to make the uh, layout calc demo available. It's not available yet, but this one's available currently because it's effectively the same as the one that I, that I included in my first or in the article that I did last summer. 
So we come over here and uh, we've got three scripts. So the sales list, the idea was just bare bones. Hey, I've got 28 records here, export them. Give me user-friendly column names without me having to pollute my schema. Look, nothing up my sleeve, no helper fields, right? And um, I'm not gonna go into massive detail on what's going on in the script, but I just point out a few salient features. Um, you sort of do some basic configuration, uh, you set up your fonts and you and then you set up your formats and the formats are now names names that you've assigned like text right title center and then so that so once you've assigned them here then later in the sheet you can reference them by name okay so um think of them as named styles and uh so then here i'm writing the header and then I'm literally walking the records, writing it one row at a time. Instead of A1, you know, B3, that instead of standard Excel addressing, it has a, z a pair of zero based coordinates and it does row first. So if so, you have to think in sort of like with JSON array addressing, it's, uh, it's strictly numeric and it's uh, zero based. So the first row is row zero, the first column is column zero. So then I'm just running through row by row. When I get down to the bottom, um, some of the column widths I want to set manually. And what I'm saying here is from zero to zero. So I'm saying the first column, set the first column to this. B, C, and D are auto-sized. And, oh, and then E is manually sized. So notice from one to three means columns B, C, and D. Negative one says auto size. You can't auto size till you've written the sheet because it doesn't know how wide to make the column. Okay. And you just save it, free up the memory. So what's kind of nice about something like this is with a lot of times, uh, once you've got some working code, you can just take it and transform it uh, for the next for the next sheet you want to do. So this was all well and good as a as a sort of bare bones training wheels kind of spreadsheet. The next example uh, is the same thing, but it's got more going on. And what's going on on this, let's say sales list uh, on steroids. So this was produced also with the plugin, but uh, some of the more interesting things that are going on is that these two columns were dynamically calculated. So this was not data in the system. The script did this and figured these out as it wrote each row. It did the math and figured this out. It assigned the formatting to the cells. It made live formulas and put them here. It then you know, did some notes with some formatting um, and it locked the top row and all that was done from the plugin. And uh, the script for that is um, just an elaboration of what we already saw. So just real quick, uh, number two. One thing I'll point out because this was a pain point for me was um, that when I was writing text or dates, I would use write string. But when it's a number, I had to use write num. And if you don't, if you get that wrong, your formatting won't work. So you'd be like, wait a minute, I know I set up my, I know I wanted percentage formatting on that final column. But if you if you wrote the data with write string, it's not going to format it correctly. So, um, and here you can see I'm writing formulas. Right. So, oh, what's interesting is even notice even though I said you had to use zero based indexing. If you're going to write the formula, you're going to write it just as if you typed it in. So in this case, I'm saying F and I'm minus E, all right? Let's just put the summary row on the bottom, adding the notes, column widths, freezing the top row. That's a fun one. Oh, you can you can set what the zoom level is on opening. As I say, basically, it's incredibly granular and, and there's dozens, if not hundreds of separate functions. So. Uh, you can really make it what you want. 
and then uh, the, the final example I'm going to show is uh, just close that. is what if we wanted to, so far we're looking at things that are just glorified exports, but what if we instead wanted to create, say, the kind of summary report that you might normally do with virtual list, but we want that in a, in a spreadsheet instead. So that's uh, example number three, sales summaries by state and by type. So what's interesting here is we're actually gonna do two, basically the same data summarized two separate ways uh, and produce it at one shot like so. I'll stick with these ranges, I like that. Um, yes, it's been created. Would you like to open it? Yeah, so, so basically what we've got, uh, this is, I forget what's the technical term when you merge, the, I guess merge cells, that's been merged across the top, just the file name. Um, here's the original summarized by state. So uh, with there's the total for the state summary and then the same exact data, but uh, grouped by type instead of by state. So of course those two totals better match than they do. A lot of formula there. And um, in terms of what's going on in the script, it's not a whole lot different than what it was before, except I went ahead and made it, um, I broke it out with a subscript to do the heavy lifting uh, to grab the data, A, so it could run server side if you're hosted, and uh, B, it just, it just feels like a nice model to sort of separate the place where the data is aggregated. So in this case, I just, uh, let me see if that's still, I forget if that's still in the data viewer or not, if that's available to us. Let's see, current. Okay. So if I, um, I don't know if it's worth seeing, but you know, it only takes a sec. So let's take a look. Could jump over here, run it with the debugger and let's uh, set a breakpoint here. Yeah. Okay. So what just happened was the, the subscript ran and went looping through uh, aggregating the data. And then uh, it produced this thing called report object. And report object looks like uh, that's not very friendly. So let's add it to the watch tab and uh, JFE it. Oh, oops. So it made a JSON object with two keys, report one and report two, and then each one's an array. So that's the first one, and that's the second one. And that was what was returned by the subscript and then uh, parsed out by the main script. Yeah. Let me just check my notes and see if there's uh, anything else I wanted to say about that. Um, Yeah, and of course, this is just scratching the surface. Um, there's what, did, what does the summary look like? Um, the summary is a when you say the summary, do you mean what, what's that, the doing that's that's cell. Holding the summary? Yeah, how are you setting that cell? Okay, so this, this, the cells at the well, let's look at report two, right? Uh, here's here's report two, right. Right, so it's writing that formula like that, and it's just saying, here's what I want you to do. And I'm telling it to format it with dollar format, which is a style that I set up earlier in the script. So the actual Excel formula is put in there. Right, right, we're okay. putting live formulas in. So it's yeah. a really different way of thinking, but if you, if you do virtual list, you probably already um, are used to some of these techniques. Right, but the idea that hey, I'm gonna set, I'm gonna have a subscript that's gonna go run on the server, it's gonna go aggregate the data, return it as JSON. Now back here in the calling script, I can parse that out and do what I want with it. All right, but this is dynamic, so where that occurs is not doesn't have to specify what you're summarizing. What I was trying to get at. Ah, yeah, yeah. This is just saying hey, <laughs> I'm gonna. Uh, here's a formula, and I'm assuming you already did what you were supposed to do, uh, okay. so that the formula makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I think that's all I got. So I don't know if there's any questions. While we're looking at that, Kevin, you're using the same variable, the X, as, as two different things. How does that go into the... Oh, that's, X is yeah. just my excuse to... X is just my excuse to call the reach into the to call the function. So X X itself is meaningless. Right? It's just a way to say, hey, do this. Right? Okay. On uh okay, we yeah. have two competing uh plugins. We have the base out or base, was it base elements? So or... right. Boy, oh, yeah. you have the people that make base elements make a plugin called FMXL that uses live Excel. Um, Monkey Bread, may, if you're already using MBS, it's not a separate right. standalone plugin. It's an add-on to MBS. It's a separate license. Um, and then uh, either way, you get the same benefit. So basically the syntax between them is similar or identical? Yes, it's similar. You, it's, you, you can't copy and paste one to the other. You would have to transform it some, but because right. it's going it's, to, it's not exactly the same, but the internals are the same. It'll be the same function, right? Because it's the same call the live Excel. Right. So, yeah, I think if you're already using monkey bread, um, you know, getting the Excel add-on uh, might be a good option for you. Does that library Which one are you using, Kevin? I'm using the Goya one because I wanted to be able to um, share this with my clients that were not Monkey Bread users, and I wanted to be able to give them this power independently. But say you were in house and you already had Monkey Bread, and you were going to be using it uh, primarily in house or on, only on projects where Monkey Bread was already installed, that would be a very viable path to consider. I have not looked at the financial difference and weighed those implications. I was just looking for the ability for any FileMaker client for me to, you know, buy the, you know, license the developer license and be able to give them this capability, irrespective of whether they had monkey bread. Um, where does the library actually live? Is it in the plugin? So you don't have to reference outside or. Right. You just install the connection? plugin and, and, and it takes care of it. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Okay. I I would I um, I want to share with you that uh, we are using MBS uh, and we had to replicate a very complex uh, um, spreadsheet with a lot of style sheet and and so on. And uh, we and the company the customer wanted to be identical to the to the spreadsheet that they used to to have. And uh, so you you can start from a template. So we 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 started from from a, an Excel uh, uh, sheet that you can put in inside a container, and then we we are populating it with uh, data. And we we are using uh, MBS, and uh, but the styling of the of the of the sheet is done also by the customer that can change it in the template. And then we 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 bring the the template and we populate it with the with MBS. Nice. Okay. And it it it's a a, com, a company with one million of of budget in IT, and so there are a lot of stuff inside, a lot of lines. But the summary are they wanted to 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 be identical to 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 what they used to have before. It's 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 quite, it's quite fun to do. Yeah. So it looks like looking at Goya's page, the 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 um, developer purchases the license, and then that's can be used in any any client. Yes, but it needs to be renewed every year. It's a it's a annual license. So your developer's license key would go into each client's. Uh, scripts or whatever to register it. Yep. That's different. Well, I, th I think a lot of plugins work that way. Yeah. Kevin, great job. I actually 
at the end of our presentation here at the end, um, Charles had mentioned that there's going to be a report builder. We're actually doing some similar stuff with a little bit different twist on it. So great job, Kevin. I'm excited to tag up with you on that one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll just say this. It's such a breath of fresh air to be able to build whatever, whatever you want in a spreadsheet. I'm actually, as much as I love virtual list, and some of you know, I'm pretty serious about virtual list. Um, I, more and more, I'm like basically doing what I would have done with virtual list, going out, harvesting the data, using fast summaries or whatever technique I want, building the JSON. But then instead of doing it in virtual list, I'm just making the spreadsheet. Yeah. So, and yeah, it's, and it's a total breath of fresh air. Absolutely. I wish, I wish I'd had it 20 years ago. <laughs> you know? All right. Thank you, folks. Kevin, do yeah. you think that it's, it's you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time making custom reports for our customers, you know, sometimes dozens of reports in each solution uh, for anything they could possibly use. Do you think this is a path to simplifying that and being able to just write it into Excel and say, here, here, you know, and. Uh, yeah. And I work a lot with accounting people and that's what they want anyway. So even when I was right. doing a virtual list, they'd be, you know, I'd add a button export to Excel, you know? Right. And so, you know, I, I um I think it's a it's a judgment call and it's partly that what the client wants but um but one nice thing is if you say to them hey would you like this in a, a, in Excel format a lot of times they say yes absolutely right. and including right. you can send it out locked right so you can send them a spreadsheet where there's either all or most of the cells are locked if you you know if you don't want them to just be able to change it willy nill right so. right. Well, Kevin, have you done you. any performance testing compared to some of your old techniques? Uh, they're all fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I know, feel I've been really pleasantly surprised with the behavior. A virtual list is fast too. I mean, if you, yeah. if you said, right. So yeah, I, I mean, I think it can write uh, thousands of rows a second. So it probably depends on how, how wide those rows are. Yeah, I agree. Our, our performance has been amazing. I just didn't know if you had done any testing. You're so good with the, the testing stuff. Thank you. Okay. Well, okay. thank you so much for that presentation, Kevin. That was great. I think we all learned things. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. So um, next up, uh, we're going to have Chris Moyer. Chris, are you awake? I am there. Yes. Yay. I am so you should be able to share your screen. And Chris is going to give us the tech roundup for this last month. New new things. All right. Can you guys see this? Yes. yes. Awesome. Okay. So this is the January edition of Tech Roundup. And just for those of you who may or may not be familiar with how I do this, I generally look back 30 days and sort of see what's been going on and kind of curate uh, things a little bit. Just, you know, the, the goal is to find stuff that might be of some tangential interest to the FileMaker developer community. Sometimes I get into security issues or other emerging technologies. Uh, and this time, I'm going to start with the recent announcement of the Apple Vision Pro, which is coming out on February 2nd. And this may seem like a weird thing to get into for FileMaker developers, but it is pertinent. I can't imagine what I would ever do with this. But for those of you who don't know, if you have Apple Silicon hardware and you have Xcode on there, you have the option to take, you know, you might have cooked up something with the... Um, FileMaker Go SDK and compiled it for, you know, an iPad or what have you as a standalone app. You can also compile it as a standalone app for the Apple Vision Pro. You just set it up as a uh, supported destination, recompile the thing, and bang, you can put it on the Vision Pro. Um, you do have to run this on Apple Silicon hardware to have this option available to you. Uh, that'll give you the Apple Vision Simulator, and you can have a FileMaker Go app running on Apple Vision Simulator. Again, I have no idea what I would ever do with this, but I think it's kind of a fun, stupid pet trick. So I'm going to mess with it. I, I've got everything all set up. I haven't done one yet. Um, I just took the little tasks template and compiled it and rolled it into the SDK and said, yeah, this looks like it'll work. Um, 
fun things to experiment with might be seeing if you could do, because there's some transparency in some of these apps, it'd be fun if you could try and make it transparent. I'll make her go app where you actually have like little text floating around or something like that. I don't think it would work. I think you have to have an opaque background in FileMaker Go apps. But uh, anyway, just looking at stuff like that, seeing what, what on earth I might do with it. Maybe I'd have a list of my record collection pointed at my bookcase or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, I just thought it was fun that you could even do this. So for those of you who've used the FileMaker Go SDK, check this out. It might be uh, something. Again, I have no idea what a use case or a usable use case might be, but just FYI. Um, for those of you who use email out of FileMaker and send notifications or whatnot, or communications to clients or status updates or anything like that, and you send through Microsoft Exchange, um, sometimes people host Exchange Server on-prem and they're in what they're calling extended maintenance. It's not end of life per se, but they won't do bug fixes and things like that. If they find security issues, they'll release patches up through, um, I guess, 20, October 2025. Um, so it'll still have some support. But if you are sending emails to Exchange 2019 on-prem, you should probably be thinking about your exit plan to get off of that um, because it's going away. And um, if you come across bugs, they probably won't be fixed. Uh, what else is going on? So about this time last year, we noted that there were tons and tons of layoffs in the tech space. And that was mostly because interest rates had skyrocketed so much that the sort of value of future revenues was way down from what it was. And the uh, numbers didn't really work for all these startups, um, places like Airtable and things like that, that were pre-IPO. And so there were tons of layoffs last year uh, through like even the first three quarters of the year. It ticked up a little bit uh, in Q4. But um, anyway, here we are again at the beginning of the year and seeing a few layoff notices. It's not anything like the uh, avalanche that it was last year. So Google uh, laid off a bunch of people on Wednesday. Um, Google Assistant um, uh you know, people in that sort of sector um, got knocked down. They laid off, um, I don't think I have an exact amount. It's in the hundreds of employees. Um, Amazon has also laid off 500 people at Twitch, um, also several hundred more at their MGM and Prime Video divisions. Um, the 500 people at Twitch amount to 35% of the uh, staff there. Um, so Twitch was acquired by Amazon nine years ago, and they're reportedly still unprofitable. So um, it looks like there this might just be the beginning. It sounds like there's probably more to come here. Um, and I guess as just sort of an aside, there's the prime uh, Amazon's looking to boost the uh, prime video revenue by showing ads to viewers who are already on prime. So one of the big attractions of prime was that uh, you had ad free movies and now even that's going away. So anyway, it looks like Amazon's really doing some uh, belt tightening. Uh, hey, once it's, yeah. uh, if it's okay, could I just interject one thing yeah, well, real in. quick? Um, th I think they're going to charge you two ninety nine extra if you want an ad free experience. There you have it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting because I've been a big fan of uh, Netflix over the year. I sort of early on, I doubted their strategy when they made the pivot to streaming from DVDs and stuff like that. And they keep coming back. I'm like, wow, these people are the undead company. And so anytime anyone goes up against them, they go down for a little bit and then they come back. And so Disney Plus went up against them. They crashed against the rocks. And so uh, Netflix seems to be beating all comers. And so I'm not surprised that Amazon is, you know, finding themselves in an uncompetitive position when Netflix introduced ads to their platform. Amazon figured they were leaving money on the table. So here we are. Um, so um, this is getting back to the uh, layoff stuff I was talking about before. So the sort of headline here in the CIO journal was that uh, IT employment across the economy added just 700 jobs in 2023. But what really happened is there was a huge bloodbath in the first three quarters of the year. 
And then um, they added a whole bunch of jobs in the uh, last quarter of the year. So we're actually on the upswing, even though in the aggregate, it looks just sort of bad for the tech sector. Yeah, um, Stephen Blackwell just made a note that Discord just laid off 17% of its employees this morning. Oh, wow. So, so you may not have seen that. There's still more. No, I missed that one. I did sort of a final scan as we were doing the uh, uh, casual discussion at the beginning, and I did not catch that one. So good catch, Stephen. Uh, let's see. So in the Q4, uh, the tech sector added a little over 21,000 IT jobs. So that's sort of a nice little upswing. And again, we're, we're seeing some stuff here, but it's not anything like what we're seeing in Q1 of um, 2023. So um, there was a in the story, there was a quote from uh, Walmart's senior vice president of business services, and he said that they picked up some tech workers laid off from big tech firms, said, I've never seen it easier to hire great talent. So good for some, not so good for others. So there you have it. Um, <coughs> GPTs. So oh, uh, this is um, can be found on the OpenAI website. You can see the URL at the bottom of the screen there. So in months past, we've had conversations about um, uh, Airtable and how one of the great features that they used to have was the Airtable universe. And, you know, it answered the question sort of preemptively, well, that's cool and all, but what would I do with it? And I think AI is in a similar spot these days. A lot of people have seen ChatGPT and say, wow, that's really cool. It can write term papers for me or give me a first draft of a contract or legislation or a legal brief or what have you but what would I do with it? And so this, um, these GPTs answers that question of what would I do with it? And I think a lot of people in the FileMaker community and, and their clients, if they have clients, have been asking themselves this question for the last several months, like, well, this is really neat. It looks really powerful. What should we do with it? And a lot of us have been sort of groping around for what are the good use cases? What is the killer app of AI at the intersection of FileMaker? And I think these GPTs here, which have, you know, every month they're gonna feature a different set. So here's one about find trails that fit your net nature hike. So if you were in the forestry or national park sector or something like that, you'd say, oh, that's really cool. That would be handy for me. So I think it's worth uh, poking your head in and uh, just browsing through there and see if it, use it as a kind of an idea board to say what might, be a good fit for the kinds of clients you work in or at the organization you work at to see would this something like this be useful for me so i thought it was interesting this has been out uh what a couple of months now um and there are over three million custom versions of chat gpt now so there's a lot to look through here i don't think you're going to get through this in a weekend or anything like that so they've uh, created the gpt store there's a little blog post about it if you go to open ai uh, I know some people in the FileMaker community, I think Portage Bay has a custom GPT for FileMaker. So uh, people are starting to tinker around with this and do stuff with it. And I think it's uh, uh, worth looking at if you uh, are still trying to figure out what you want to do with AI. Uh, other stuff in the news, um, a lot of legal stuff in the AI space. A lot of you have probably heard that, uh, you know, a few months ago, back in the fall, I think September, October timeframe, uh, different uh, authors like um, uh, George R. R. Martin, uh, Sarah Silverman, uh, several authors have uh, sued uh, OpenAI and Microsoft saying they're infringing on their copyrighted works that were used for training uh, large language models. Um, now they're trying to, uh, writers Nicholas Basbanes and Nicholas Gage, I have no idea who these guys are, but they are trying to put together a class action lawsuit to um, sue these people and say their their copyrights have been infringed and they should get a share of the action. So this is sort of not unlike Spotify and other streaming services where you have musicians who put together music and then these people can just consume that content. And so this feels very analogous to me, and I'm guessing there's going to be some sort of legal fallout to this. The New York Times has also sued Microsoft, saying this goes way beyond the fair use of their content. This is the wholesale consumption of their content, and then using it to uh, create generative output. So 
Uh, I don't think we've seen the last of this. Um, it should be interesting to see how it plays out. I'm guessing more people are going to pile on. Um, Microsoft certainly has deep pockets. OpenAI is a weird sort of nonprofit uh, corporate structure that owns a for-profit um, sort of wholly owned subsidiary. So it should be interesting. David, you have a thought? Yeah, just on that, on, um, on that topic, Chris, I was at a business conference the other day and it was, uh, they, they started talking about the use of AI generated imagery of buildings and the owner of the building's rights. So if you're the owner of the Flatiron building in New York City and somebody generates an AI version of that and how do you claim building rights of that being used in film or marketing materials or things of that nature. So it's getting very wide reaching in terms of uh, the, the number of people who are looking at usage and legal uh, elements around it. Yeah, it, it's interesting to sort of observe and imagine how it might play out. You know, the revenue is ramped up really fast. We're talking very large dollars here. And so I find it hard to believe that some of these original creators are not going to be able to um, successfully lobby for some slice of that pie. I, I think it's probably going to happen, but I can't imagine how, you know, where, how do you identify the slice of the derivative work that an output generated and, you know, all that kind of stuff just sounds crazy complicated to me. It's not at all like, say, a radio station that will keep a log and say, we played this specific work at this time or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I think this is something to watch, but I think it's going to be a mess before it uh, gets resolved. Let's see a couple Apple users in the user group. I'm guessing, um, this story about, uh, so Apple airdrop has been, um, sort of had a known compromise for years and the driver behind this is that, um, there was a 2022 report in the New York Times that said Chinese activists have uh, taken to go into like say a subway station or something like that and just airdrop, you know, critiques of the Chinese Communist Party to any nearby iPhone users and stuff like that. Basically stealth, stealth leafleting, if you will, using airdrop to just drop a uh, um, uh, prohibited content to big crowds in public places. And Apple sort of made a concession to them um, where uh, I guess in with the release of iOS 16.1.1, the airdrop users in China found that the everyone configuration was gone and it was reset to contacts only. So basically you could only give it to people you knew. And uh, critics were not happy with Tim Cook about making that concession to the Chinese authorities. And then so on Monday, officials uh, in Beijing have confirmed that they have used an advanced encryption attack to de-anonymize users of AirDrop in China. So if you go to China ever, don't use AirDrop because they've got you at this point. Um, so if you try and use uh, AirDrop or you're con sending, uh, mass sending illegal content, things like that, they will be on to you very quickly. Uh, so some people have reported that their iPhones received a video with inappropriate remarks in the Beijing subway. And after preliminary investigation, they found the suspect right away. They used the airdrop uh, function. They've um, implemented technical measures to identify people mass distributing content. So they can now home in on you if you're using airdrop in China. And so the Chinese government did this as a, uh, you know, air quote, national security measure to protect against this sort of activity. So um, they basically broke the encryption on airdrop. What about outside China? Well, the Chinese know how to do it. So I'm guessing if they have any sort of operational people outside China, they'll do it there too. You know, if, uh, yes, you know, in Canada or other places where Chinese dissidents tend to hang out and make noise, I'm guessing those people are going to get targeted. So uh, well, I'm, I would, yeah, but also what about non-Chinese? Uh, I mean, are, they can't be the only ones who've broken the encryption. Well, exactly. Now that they have the capability, uh, you know, I think uh, you should um, be cautious in public places. So I think AirDrop is fine in privacy of your own home or in an office environment or something like that. But 
uh, until Apple does something uh, encryption wise in response to this, I think you should consider it a leaky uh, mechanism for sharing data. Paul, did you have a thought? Paul Costanza? I don't think so. I see you back there in silhouette. I like the uh, the lighting effect you have going there. You're looking very uh, Doctor Evil. Sorry, just click the wrong button. <laughs> I was checking my I was checking my airdrop settings. Yeah, no worries. Um, the other thing to talk about here is um, so some of you maybe in years past have heard about the Mirai botnet. Um, this was. Um, um, uh, some botnet software, it exploited Telnet, and basically it, it would infect a Linux device and then have the Linux device turn around and check around on the network and say, hey, see if you can find any open Telnet connections. And if you can, uh, basically do brute force attacks on weak passwords using Rainbow Table or what have you. And um, if that... Um, if that happened, then they would crack it and they would infect that device and have it join the botnet. So um, at some point that got shut down and the creators of Mirai uh, released their source code and uh, a group, and I don't think I have the group name uh, on it, but the, uh, the new variant of the Mirai botnet is now called NoahBot. And instead of building a botnet, it will look around and it will try and compromise weak SSH connections instead of Telnet connections, different port. And rather than do uh, DDoSing, it will actually install a modified version of XM Rig, which is a uh, crypto mining software. And so it is, you know, this thing is a worm, so it's self-replicating. It'll just sort of prowl around the internet and um, uh, install mining rigs on uh, Linux servers. So for those of you who are using cloud-based Linux servers, Keep an eye on them and see if you see any spikes in activity or network usage or um, CPU usage or anything like that or GPU usage, anything along those lines. Um, they are under attack. This has been going on for about a year. And um, I haven't read anything about, uh, you know, um, what you can do to block, I guess what you can do to block it is make sure that you have SSH shut off. But if you have SSH shut off, um, then how are you going to talk to your Linux server? So at the very least, you should probably uh, increase your password strength on your Linux devices. So that's uh, one thing. And I think that is all I've got for right now. So thanks for watching. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for putting in all that effort and presentation. Sure. We appreciate it every month. All right, everyone. I am going to pause three. All right, everyone, welcome back after the break. I hope we all enjoyed it, and I know I did. And uh, we have a case study using FM Better Forms um, and from MavicQ. So the um, Vanessa Costanza and, okay, I know I have a list here. Here, I can, I can get you here. <laughs> and Vanessa, okay, there you go, Andrew Dam and Charles Dell are all here to tell us about a case study, a case study we have not had a case study in a long time. So I'm really looking forward to this. So please take it away, Vanessa. Awesome, thank you. And thanks for having us. And we're really excited to talk about this case study um, with a client of ours, Great Kids, and our use case for FM Better Forms. Uh, the primary people that work on this project are Chris Conger and myself from NaviQ, and then Andrew and Charles uh, from FM Better Forms, who are also here today, and will be will be chiming in as we move along. I'm sure as as there are things that we're missing or forgetting. So um, we're going to jump right in. I will say, if there are any questions, feel free to chime in as we're going along. Um, we'll also have some time at the end, too, if there's anything that comes up um, kind of from a holistic perspective. So we're going to start um, in some slides, kind of going over um, the business problem, what we are doing, and then we'll jump into an overview of the part of the solution we're talking about for this use case. And then Chris will get under the hood in Better Forms and uh, Claris FileMaker. So uh, this 
business or case study is for one of our clients, Great Kids. They are a company that deals in early childhood education. Um, so they're a nonprofit organization. They create curricula and products that they sell to a variety of um, institutions. A lot of them are state departments of health, um, local um, state agency, local and state agencies, that kind of thing. Um, they have a home visiting curriculum for those people to go in and use um, within people's homes and then a variety of products that support that. So um, we had built kind of an entire system for them. But in this case, we want to focus on the online um, purchase and assignment process. So a lot of things led to this, uh, this project. And they had a lot of changes in their business model over the last few years since we've been working with them. Originally, pre-COVID, they were all in-person training. So they would fly their trainers to different parts of the U.S. and Canada, and they would have uh, sessions in person where they would train these people who then would be certified to go out and utilize their curriculum. During COVID, that obviously changed. They weren't able to be traveling and going in person. So they moved to kind of this online trainer-led uh, model. So they would still all be kind of synchronously teaching um, in these classes where people would sign up for the events at specific times. They would come and go through the whole process, very similar to how they had in person, but kind of in this digital format. And that was kind of V1 of this partner portal process was really that registration when they would sign up for an event. They had another kind of shift in their business model, which has led to V2, which we're really going to dig into today, and where they're now allowing people to kind of have a self-paced experience. So they are able to sign up and say, I want to be certified in GGK P36, and they can take that course whenever they want. It could be midnight, and they could be going through their um, sessions and their videos and um, as, as soon as they get their materials to do that, they're able to kind of go at their own pace. So that was the big thing that led to this partner portal and this change in um, purchase and assignment. The other thing is that they had previously been using an online kind of paper order form. It was a lot of manual entry, a lot of redundancy, a lot of opportunity for error, the main things that we see when we have that kind of process. And it was really labor intensive. Um, especially tying everything back together in QuickBooks. Another thing that has kind of led to this uh, partner portal is that many of their agencies are buying in bulk. So one person will come in for the agency and purchase 10, 15, 20, 100 um, cert certifications for a curricula, and then they will then assign them to the participants, but they might not know who those participants are. So I might know the first five people that I'm going to have today, but my other 20 copies that I've purchased, I might not know until Q3, Q4. And so we had to find a way to really handle that well um, and to make that a really good user experience. Previously, they had been using Shopify for only their product-based materials. They weren't doing any of their kind of event or curriculum certifications on Shopify, just because of some of the complications um, with their POs and the different things that they had to account for. One of the big reasons um, why we moved away from Shopify um, were some of the pain points that they had. Um, so here you can see um, there were some issues with some of the requirements they had of how many of each license different people could purchase. Um, a lot of this we've been able to um, kind of come back in FileMaker and make uh, data-driven to allow that business logic to be um, kind of editable or changeable as their business model changes moving forward. Um, but another thing was just the, the issues they were having with that difference between purchaser and participant um, and getting that to align in Shopify in a very clear manner was something that they, they had struggled with. And one of the reasons we moved towards a partner portal. So just kind of an overview of where we started. When we started with them, I believe in late 2021, they were using 68 different software tools um, with a lot of redundancy overlap uh, and nothing was really integrated or talking with each other. So this was kind of our visualization for them of like, here's where you're at and how you're working right now. 
Now we've moved to kind of this hub and spoke. So the center circle is really what we're calling Great Kids Connect, which I'll show you here in a second, um, which is our Claris FileMaker system that their staff are using. Um, and all the ones around the outside are different tools that we're using, um, that we're integrating with in various forms. I believe Chris is going to get into Lock Lizard and Talent LMS a little bit later on, as those are, are important within this partner portal process as well. So now I will jump back over into FileMaker. For this uh, part of our project, we really are only going to focus on our operations section. So um, in our online orders and our shipping. So as we can see here in FileMaker, um, we have our online orders section built out um, as well as our shipping. Um, we are doing shipping either from an event standpoint or in this case for um, what we're looking at today, our purchases standpoint. And then we're integrating with NRG to actually complete the UPS shipping process uh, and, and send, those, send those out. On the FM Better Form side, um, we have our general catalog here. So um, they are able to go in and FileMaker, populate this catalog and all of the pricing, shipping, any of the required fields or anything like that. Um, we're able to come in and go to this one here. Um, we're able to come in and see kind of this full product page. So all the information that they're able to populate um, that we're passing from FileMaker right into better forms. I can add this to my cart and I'll just run through a quick um, purchase process here. So able to edit any of our quantities or anything like that in our shopping cart. It's automatically calculating our shipping and handling based on what was entered in FileMaker, um, which can be different for each type of product. Um, and then we're using Stripe on our payment process credit card side and Uppy for our PO upload on the PO side. So I'll go through and create this as a credit card. And they, uh, obviously, their curricula is their intellectual property, so their license terms and conditions are really important to them. Um, so as you can see, I can currently not complete my payment process because I have not scrolled through and read my terms and conditions. And so once I do that, I can confirm my payment. And I'm right in my account, and I can go in and assign my items. So this is kind of where we get to that um, part of the difference between the purchaser and the participant. I'm gonna come over into a different account here. Um, and so we can see, so for this account, they've used a PO a few times, they've used a credit card a few times, and they are not able to go in and assign anything for these purchase orders until they're approved. So that was one of the things that was really important to build into this process. Um, in better forms. And so able to do that really seamlessly, really easily. If I come into this order here, um, we get into kind of that order detail. So I can see all of the physical items that I've purchased. So these are things that are being shipped. All of the digital items. So these are things that um, there was no shipping involved. It's just a digital distribution, verifying a valid and unique email address along with that person's name. And then some of our items are kind of hybrid where we have both physical and digital. Um, so for this one, we can see this item here has shipped um, and I cannot edit it. This item here has not yet shipped. So I could go in and delete this and add in a new address. And we're changing, obviously, our shipping fields based on um, the country selected. And then here for our quantity, we'll see it will not let me select any more than the current number that are available. So if I had purchased 10, I'd already shipped eight, it would only allow me to select two for this shipment. Um, so just simple things like that, um, allowing them to build in some of their business logic. 
and then being able to do our digital assignments right in the same place. Um, so we can see this one was rede redeemed. This one has not been redeemed yet. And so we are able to either resend that invite to kind of give them a reminder or delete it and invite someone else. So one of the big reasons um, that we really kind of went towards better forms for this project, there was a, a variety of reasons why we switched from Shopify to better forms. A big one for us was just our skill set. So it allows us to kind of take our FileMaker skill set um, and leverage that even more um, right within better forms and being able to use that right within the pro process, um, not having to, to learn and utilize Shopify. Um, and another big one was time. Um, so being able to do what we needed to do, fix things on the fly, fix things as we're going through the process. I'm gonna go back to our slides here. So I'll talk a little bit really quick about our process and how we kind of got um, got going with the FM Better Forms team. And then Chris will jump into some of the technical side of things here. So um, when we started with Better Forms, it was really beneficial for us to partner with their team um, because not only do we have their skill set and expertise, but they know the platform best. So it was great to have um, their expertise and their knowledge uh, in helping us with this. So. The project was kind of split into three to four different segments. Uh, we worked with Pearson from Better Forms on the design. So we went through and we mocked up everything in Figma, um, which I believe Chris is going to show you here in a little bit. And then um, once we got signed off on that, Chris was doing the Claris, Better, Claris FileMaker development and Andrew and Chris were working together on the Better Forms development. So we kind of had a, a couple of different groups and teams moving along through this process, um, which was really helpful, not only from a, a timing standpoint, but also just from a different perspective standpoint as well. And then lastly, kind of um, getting into the QA and testing side of things. So we have been really big into um, getting our clients involved in testing. Um, Chris will talk in a minute kind of about how we do our deployment and our uh, production testing and development environments. Um, but we do all of our QA and testing, QA and testing internally on our development server. And then our client does all of their QA uh, testing on the testing server using our ticket system that we've kind of integrated into our whole nine step development process. Um, so these are some of the tickets that were involved in this process. Um, I will give a little plug. I am doing a dev or an engaged session on February 8th at 1.30 on our process and how we've integrated our ticket system, our uh, development environment, testing environment, and production environment into really helping us build uh, better processes, better communication with our clients. So that is my plug for that uh, as well. Um, and with that, I am going to let Chris get into development and deployment. And I think you're muted, Chris. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the deployment process first because I think that's one of the huge things that has been beneficial for our development and better forms fits right into that process. Um, we do have three different servers that we use for all our development. And we try to do some sort of color coding so the people know which environment they're in. Um, I've been guilty of it many times, but even to the point that when I open up a um, window here, even my header inside the window will match my environment. Um, so you can see that this is a green. And if I were to open it up on the production, it is... It, it matches and stays consistent just to help us know where we're at. We use auto for all our moving from FileMaker to FileMaker, and that has been an absolute lifesaver and has really changed the way that we've been able to develop um, in, in great fashion. But then on, for us, the big key that wasn't always there, but has been there probably the last three years, Charles, at least, the deployment cycle um, is just, incredible 
uh, it really, I know Charles put something out the other day about it can't get any easier. It really can't. So if I were to come in here and we'll talk more about better forms here and giving you some ideas, but if I came in and just took a registration page and let me just say, I changed this to section highlight or whatever and saved it. If I came back into the Great Kids app, you can see now it says edited. It tells me what page I've edited. And then at that point, I can go ahead and deploy it. I'll deploy it to testing, to what we call testing, and hit deploy. And that is deploying all the better forms code we need for the site to be up and running. Um, so it is incredibly helpful in our development process, the way that this deployment works for our customers. And we do have full rollback. So if I wanted to roll that back to the version that was just before, something like this one, I can roll that back and handle the rollback as well. And you have at each page level also, you have the ability to roll back. Um, so the mechanics of better forms have been really huge for our deployment and, and how it goes through. Um, like Vanessa said, everything that we are doing for great kids is in better forms and everything's data driven. So like that catalog that you guys saw, all of this info is entirely data driven. Um, they have full control. I'm a big believer in turning control over to our customers as much as possible. And this is all data driven. Now this is their dev one, but um, they can come over here in the products and all those fields that you see displaying there are right within the, the details section here for them, the, the pricing, all the different items that they need to set up for it um, all exist right in here. So the deployment, the development and the deployment process between auto and better forms, it has allowed us to truly develop in a great fashion where we get to develop, test on our development server, then move it to testing for our clients to test and we do additional testing there. And it increases our confidence. By the time we get to production, we feel very confident in, in where we're at in the process. Um, any questions about our deployment strategy and how we we go about it? Actually, Chris, I, I have some questions for you guys. Yeah. Um, so, when at what point do you say, yeah, this version is ready to to deploy from dev to staging and vice versa, or not vice versa, but vice versa, um, testing to production? Like, how do you? What metrics do you use, and what's your thought or methodology around that? Yeah, I don't know if it's metrics. What we do is we have an assigned group of tickets in our sprint, um, and we take that and basically. I try to plan out so I can get it done in a week and a half time period. And then we'll, at that end of that time period, it's, it's more calendar cycle for us. Hopefully I can get through all those tickets. If there's one or two I don't get to, then those get moved obviously to the next sprint, but we are very calendar based. So our clients can schedule their testing into their calendar. Um, so it's not so much, Hey, we got to get this amount done. It is, Hey, I have till, January 16th to get the sprint done. I need to I need to get that stuff done by January 16th. So so this might be maybe a, might be more of a Vanessa question, but so you get a ticket coming in from your client and what if the ticket I understand if the ticket says, you know, fix the wording on this certain page. But what mm -hmm. if the ticket says, can you add the checkbox to this page, which is a, a feature change? How do yeah. you go about mitigating or handling that so those things don't go sideways? In your whole build up pro build out process. I guess I'm not understanding the question. So, so if they like, want so if, yeah. So if a client comes up and and through the your support system, they have a feature request. Yep. Or or some kind of scope creep, or you've deemed it as scope creep. How do you how do you deal with that? And how do you mitigate yeah. that, put that into your into your workflow? Honestly, we believe our clients are right. Now we'll discuss. We have a lot of meetings with our clients. So we have a review meeting before every sprint and say, these are the tickets we're going over and we're going to work on the sprint. Um, but Great Kids is a great example. They put in far more tickets than they need, but it's kind of just a storage mechanism for us to remember 
hey, at some point, this is what they want us to get to um, within our ticket system. So there's a lot of back and forth with our clients. Here's what we need you to work on. Here's what we we don't need you to work on. Um, and they get to they get to read everything as far as how important it is, whether it's a low priority or future, so just something that's down for the future or something that's immediate or or high. And then they, they're allotted so many kind of points per sprint. So it's really up to them to sit and say, is, is this ticket worth one point more important than these five worth 0.25 each or four worth 2.5 each? Um, and it really puts some of the decisions back onto them as far as what is most important and what is um, most pressing for them. Yeah, we have not... Um done a sprint yet in this year, but I can kind of show you, we, this is our past sprint. So we do have this Kanban board that they can, and this is all in FileMaker, but they can dra drag stuff around and assign their points. But once we go into depth for that sprint, they're not to touch that particular sprint. Um, so that's kind of the idea. So we have eight points usually for most sprints, if it's a two week sprint. Any questions on that? Okay, I'll talk a little bit about why we chose. I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think Paul Jansen unmuted. Yeah, I just, I wanted to ask you, um, you obviously I'm familiar with and you demonstrated the speed of deployment with better forms. How long does the FileMaker deployment from testing to staging actually take? Yeah, with auto, it really depends on not so much the, the complexity of the database, more the data, um, the volume of data. Um, we have some clients that, like great kids, I believe, and Paul could correct me, but maybe 15 minutes, maybe half okay. an hour. Um, and we do do something in, I'll get, I'll, uh, maybe I'll show it here in a little bit, to alert our, obviously we'll tell them that we're doing a deployment, but their end users don't know, right? This is public facing. So we do have some stuff that we do within better forms to alert them that, hey, we'll be back online and the maintenance is going on. Um, but we have some that may take a couple hours as well. I know Josh Warman, at least he was on here and he he's done huge files using auto as well. And um, it really depends on the data size because it's using the migration tool. Yeah. But if you're using better forms and, you, and you're able to get environments on the FileMaker side, it is just an absolute game changer. And it's really simple, like we have different, obviously domains for the different things. And all you do is you come in here, whoops. You come in and set up, I know Paul, you're used to this, but you set up the credentials and where your helper file is located at yeah. and you set up your servers. So we have our various different servers here that we're pointing to. Uh oh, demo gods. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it. Andrew and I are texting each other right now. <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, nothing's going sideways <laughs> oh that's all right but your list of servers comes up here um sorry one more refresh your list of servers will come up and this is quite odd you've never seen that yeah that's i should i should note that eduardo was doing work on our network this morning and i just want to make sure i will text him to make sure that nothing he's doing is you're welcome with your with our assistance in your debugging here. Yeah, the demo gods got us. Good. <laughs> um, well, I will skip the next part that and I'll try to come back once we get this online. But the the cool thing about I'm not a web guy. I, I'm not I could not go out and build a whole website. And Andrew did a tremendous job of all the nuts and bolts and the hard stuff, but I'm able to do tweaks. And the cool thing is all the business logic is handled within FileMaker, which is where I feel comfortable. So the way that the mechanics of better forms works is it comes in through a helper file, which let me show you what the helper file is. There it is. So when a call gets made from the web, whether it's to the on-form request or a utility hook that's getting run, it comes into this helper file, which then directs it to where it should go. Um, 
And so it comes in the inbox here, it runs a script and it calls a script, general script in your business file. And then which that hook, when it comes in, um, which one is it? The dispatch file, it basically knows which utility to run. So if I was running, let's say, um, let's go an event registration, right? So this is on the form registration. I can do all this. This is just FileMaker. This is nothing to do with HTML. So I know how to gather data from FileMaker. However you do it, there's a lot of different techniques to do it, but I can gather the data from FileMaker and that presents it to the web. And then when a button is pushed or there's an action needed on that page, that's when your on utility hooks run. And you can see we have a couple different, there's the submit type, um, what else on this? There's a validate email, resend validate email. So there's different hooks that can be run. And it really allowed us as a development firm to really play to our strengths. And when there's small changes on the web, yeah, and I was gonna show you, it better forms is just JSON um, for us to work on. So it's really nice and easy for me to modify JSON. Um, and you can do full HTML elements, full JavaScript elements, but for me, it allowed me to use my skill sets and our skill sets within our company, um, and then use Andrew to, to do the tricky things, then the initial build and allows us to edit it. So you know, it's interesting, that, that kind of brings up a point about collaborative um, work between two, effective, effectively two dev, dev houses. And I'm not sure how many people in the audience have, have sort of had the opportunity to work. I mean, we've all probably worked a little bit subcontracting or smaller gigs, but when you have two bigger organizations kind of communicating, there has to be some, I don't wanna say rules, but there has to be some protocols, I guess you could say that we that we follow. Um, one of the ones I found that was really quite useful, and I think Vanessa will agree here on that, is to have it really well-defined what you're building. And so that there's not this this uh, creep or not change of 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 requirement uh, going along. How do you guys uh, go about managing that? Because I know personally, we're not the greatest at making sure that we stay super super narrow focused, and and this is what we're doing during the sprint. Is I that think question. For... Cool. Oh, sorry, Chris. No, please go ahead. I was going to say I think for this project specifically. Um, Working with Pearson was, I just can't stress how much, how invaluable that was. Um, and having the Figma to really be like, okay, this is what we're presenting to the client. We have all agreed that this is what we are building, that this is where we are moving, mm -hmm. that this is V1, that when this is done, V1 is done. And, and we've gone through the process with them. We've worked through the process with you. And having that also be something that's interactive and clickable so that they really get a sense of what they're going to have at the end of that uh, of that cycle was really, really, really helpful, especially for something like this, where it was a change in business model and um, kind of process for them. It really helped us and the client think through, okay, what are some of the business rules we need to decide? What are some of the um, processes we need to decide? What is, when do we want, even something as simple as when, when should we require them to log in? Like, what are the lowest barriers to entry to get to get them to purchase this product or to purchase this certification? Um, so that part was really helpful for us. But I would say generally, um, the more we've gotten into our ticket system and leveraging our ticket system, the more that has helped us avoid that creep. Um, and, and that's been really helpful for us. I don't know if anyone else has any, I think it's a very common uh, concern and issue with anyone doing custom work. Yeah, I just want to chime in there. Um, one of the big things uh, I noticed when working with Vanessa, Paul, and Chris was when we had a question about um, a certain field or some change that needs to be made, um, we don't have to go directly to the client. Um, Vanessa and Chris and Paul really knew the business logic and kind of knew what the uh, what was the defined scope, and whenever you add another middleman or another chain of communication, something could get lost. But the fact that everything was well defined uh, made that communication a lot clearer and 
kept everything in scope. Couldn't agree more. And here is the figmas that I mean I designing figmas, I think, or prototypes are such a huge benefit to actually being able to stay on task, Gerald. I think your team does a great job of doing this and staying on task to what's true in the figmas. Um I think they do a great job with it. And I think that was a huge help to us in terms of making sure. And it just sells the client, right? That they see this and they get the picture right away of how it's going to look. And they were the ones that said, yeah, that this works. Even if we spell catalog different down here in the States than you guys do up in Toronto. <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of words backwards. Yeah. So, but um I am able to get in here now. And, and this is just super simple. Like the, this is all HTML here that if you know just even basic HTML, you can go in and do it. I don't get into this level of HTML sometimes. I can change small things. But if I were to go into, let's see what we got here. Oh, this is all so great kids. I should, I should note that this app was using, so just for a bit of preface, uh, Better Forms allows develop FileMaker developers basically to build web apps uh, with varying levels of um, web technology experience. So when we tend to build stuff, if we're co-developing uh, co with a with a team like uh, NaviQ, um, we'll tend to use more advanced features and things like that. Um, but quite often you're building things without using HTML at all. Yes, very much so. And I, when I build things that I need done for myself, I'm not using the, not using the HTML. Um, there's great snippets here that you just cut and paste the snippets in, um, and it's fantastic use to to be able to do it. It's that like perfect middle ground. It's much more in depth than what you can do in Web Direct, but it still allows me as a FileMaker developer not to have to learn a whole new skill set. Any questions on just kind of the mechanics or anything I missed, Charles, in terms of how it works as far as? No, not so much that, but I, I'm actually really curious about how your client is now using it and how, you know, sort of the story ended up. Like, I, it's in production now. And yeah, yeah. You know, right. Was there anything that you missed scoping out? And it's like, holy cow, we missed this. Or, you know, we pretty much nailed it because of this iterative process in your and your development process. No, we did. We definitely missed. Um, let me present this here. There was definitely a huge miss, and I don't know if it was a miss or just their business model changed. Um, give me one second to present here. So when we first started, that is assignment project, when someone ordered, and one of the biggest things that we had to handle was often they ordered and didn't know who the product was going to be delivered to or who the product, the, the digital part was going to be assigned to. And when we first built it in version one, I would order 10 products. I would come in here then and enter in who I wanted those products to be sent to. Maybe I had... 10 of our, my coworkers that I was ordering for, and I could ship it all to all their houses all over. Um, you can probably guess the pain point in that is that as the volume of purchases got bigger and bigger, that became a bigger issue is they didn't want to have to enter in all 10 people. They wanted to be able to just put one address in and have it sent all 10 items to that address, and then they can distribute it. Um, and so that was probably one of the bigger changes we made as a lesson learned. We went from this to this, where the shipping and the assignments were totally separated. And you enter in the first name, last name, and then the shipping location information. And you can actually might as well. Vanessa, did you already show this? If I, you did, I'm sorry. Did you show this, Vanessa, already? Um. Not in that context, but I okay. have one open ready if you need to. No, I got I have one here, I think. So you can see I have the shipping and assignment, and I can put in I 
I can put in the info and then the quality quantity that I need to do and um, all those type of things to, to be able to complete it, which that was a big change. That was a, definitely a miss for us is that we should have thought ahead that even though that's what they requested is they wanted one per one shipping line item per person. It just wasn't going to work for the, I mean, when you're ordering a hundred items, you don't want to have to put in a hundred different full addresses. So that was definitely one of the misses we had early on and it was a great lesson and, and it worked out really well. How did that um, come out though? Did that come out when you actually went through like beta testing or? or No, it didn't come out in beta testing. It came out once we started seeing the data come in um, right. and you were watching people and Paul did a great job analyzing the data. And he's like, look, you guys are getting orders at 20. They're putting the same address in 20 times. Yeah. Because yeah. so it just, it made more sense to do it and just analyzing the data as it came in and getting in the real world. Now looking back on it, it seems like, oh, duh, that should have been how it was from the start. But Sometimes when those requests comes in, maybe you, you miss it or, or something along those lines. But I don't, I don't even, and, you know, in fairness, I don't even think it's really a miss. I mean, the, the nature of producing something to think that you're going to, to have the hubris to think that you're going to get it hundred percent right the first time is, yeah. you know, it, it, it's fine to, I think, iterate. I think having the ability to iterate and realizing that there's going to be a known unknown as you move forward. And when this thing hits production, there's going to be insights. Um, I think that's really important. How did you how did you go about versioning it there? Then was that like a big lift or uh, to the public face and they didn't even know there was a version change. Um, the biggest lift was obviously manipulating the data on the back end to to fit the new model. Um, but once we did that, it wasn't it was pretty straightforward. That wasn't that big a deal. Nice. I think you also uh, have the issue that sometimes clients, especially when they're changing their business processes don't know either yep Absolutely. exactly i think that was a, a big part of this mm -hmm. process and this change was this was very different from how they've operated for the last 30 years um this was a really big change and a really big shift for them and and so i think yeah there was a lot of unknown on that side as well that's a great point lynn yeah and then so they do the shipping let me go back a slide They can do the shipping, but then they can also do the assignment where they assign the people that they've actually purchased the class for. And this was one of the big things that they needed to be able to do away from Shopify because they may purchase it in January on their budget cycle, but they may not use it till for another year. So they have these credits basically sitting out there that they can assign to various people. Um, and the assignments are like a digital type thing that when an assignment comes in, Previously, they were very hand oriented. They had things in a hundred different spreadsheets. And for us, building this Great Kids Connect allowed them to take that next step in that hub and spoke that Vanessa spoke of earlier. So what happens when an assignment comes in, they get enrolled in Talent LMS, whoops, which is a learning management type system, um, basically like a virtual classroom. They Assignments can be in there. There can be message groups in there. It's, it's just a virtual classroom. But... For them, their, their um, curriculum, that's their whole deal. That's their proprietary secret sauce as you have it. And so to this lock lizard tool is an awesome tool. Um, it is a PDF management system that I'm going to bring one up on my screen right now. I'm going to open up lock lizard. You will see, you guys will not be able to see it. It should be just a black screen that I'm reading a PDF right there. It screen locks everything. You can't screen capture. You can't do anything. And what we do is when an assignment comes in, we enroll them into Lock Lizard. We know which curriculum they should have access to. Uh, through the API, we set all that information in for them. The end user receives an email saying, hey, you've been enrolled in this class and, and I, please download the Lock Blizzard app and, or you can do it from the web and you can view it directly on the web. And it has been awesome. It, I mean, they used to manually print everything and now they can actually be digital, but still have the protection that they had with printing and that it, it cannot be easily distributed electronically. So if you have a client who's looking for protecting some PDFs or some of this lock wizard is, is in a remarkable product. Chris, does it just work on PDFs or does it work on other things? Because it seems really useful. 
their digital rights. Like, managed. I don't know if it would be, I believe it's PDF only. Vanessa, do you know? I believe so. But like they're taking their, I believe they, they do all their design for their printed curricula in um, Adobe products. And so they're able to kind of convert all of that. A cool thing with Lock Lizard too is some of the interactivity that they can have with it as well. Um, and they're really just getting, starting to scratch the surface on what Lock Lizard can do. But all we've used it for so far has been kind of on the PDF side. Yeah, it's a great DRM. And they have full control of, hey, this person can have it for a month, this person. It, it's really a neat software, but we're doing that all through API calls into it. Um, so it's really neat. And then the shipping process, like Vanessa mentioned, is we're using NRG, uh, which is just a FileMaker. It's not a plugin. It's a, it's a FileMaker file that allows you to push all the stuff to UPS. And we use Uppy for the PO uploads. And then... Stripe for all the credit card payments on, on better forms. And thus far, it's been a very good success. Vanessa, I will put this up and let me see if I missed anything here. Well, if we're it. talking about integration with other packages, is there a different back end for your um, store, your retail stuff? Um, it's, you're not using Shopify anymore. No, so our this whole store here is all better forms, and then the data is all in the back end is all in this great kids connect here. So it's all right here. They have full access to defining oh, what's this first one here? Hope at home. So if I come in here and find hope at home, and change this to demo hope at home. Right. Yeah, but so I, everything... I guess I was talking about the merchant account and the actual taking of credit cards and stuff. So, yeah, we're doing that through Stripe. They do have a merchant account. Oh. We're just using Stripe to do that. Correct. Okay. Stripe. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you. Yep. I just realized I might not be matching the same things. Oh, that's my order. My catalog. Got it. Um, and then one of the final thing over running a little short on time here. Vanessa, what are the things other than the report builder? Oh, so the case study, to wrap up the case study. Vanessa, I'll let you talk about this. Um, I'll put it on the screen. This is what they've done since we, oh, I don't have the new one, Vanessa. You have the new one. Yeah, and I think I the big thing that we had seen was just kind of coming up with, when we looked at kind of the number of transactions and line items and, um, number of items per order we've really it really shows kind of that change in their business model and how before i mean they were taking every incoming product order was being handled by probably four different people within their organization in order for that to get out the door um, and now i think they have depending on the type of order and who's in the office versus working remotely that day it's one or two people um, so just from a timing standpoint um, it's really helped them cut down on their staff hours. Um, and they've they've really been able to increase the number of people that they're putting through and getting into their curriculums quickly and easily. Um, and I think they're close to 7,000 uh, event registrations um, just through the FM Better Form site so far. Um, and then I think- I'm looking right here. So. The online store part, when the, the conversion, they've done over 770 just since we implemented it. The V2 didn't come out until October, November 3rd. November, November 3rd. And then the event registration, like Vanessa said, almost 7,000. And that was since July or June of 2022. So a year and a half um, for a company that really didn't have an ability to do any of this prior I'm going to show one thing that Kevin's presentation was awesome and it saved some time in terms of me um, talking about some stuff as far as this report builder. They need, they had a need to really be able to report on this data. And like we said early on, I'm a big believer in giving, putting, giving them the tools to build stuff, but I also try to not overwhelm people with FileMaker too much. And for instance, like even... I'm not a big believer in the find mode. We they can go in find mode, I, but 
I want to make it simple for them to find 95% of their people. So you can see here we're filled. This is a table of 510,000. And this is all, there's no web viewer or JavaScript, and this is all just native FileMaker, um, but allowing them to find stuff quickly. And the same thing goes with reporting. So if they wanted to report on those orders that have come in, they can come in here. And I'm just going to select this FM disk order report. And then I'll show you how this is developed. This is using the LiveXL and um, LiveXL and Monkey Bread, but we've taken it to a whole new level, or to a different level, and not a whole new level, but they are able to build these reports themselves. We're not hand coding each report anymore. They come in here and build them. Um, so I will, if I wanted to do a new report, they come in here and just say demo participant. And they select the starting context. So they do have to have some understanding of context. And that's probably the biggest hurdle with this. But hey, they're starting at an event. And then this will populate, based on the first one, what options they have. So we we build the back end for them. So hey, I want to report on the participants. And I want to allow this for all users. And then they can come in here and add a field, whatever they want it to be. Um, let's just say first name, last name for right now. And this is where they can customize everything that Kevin was talking about as far as the styling and that. They can come in and this one they're going to make fixed width. Um, they want to set the width of it to 30. Great. And then the next one that they want to add a field in, they want it to be last name. And this one, let's say auto size to, to max width, um, so not a fixed width. And then they, if that's done. Like that report is done. If they were to come over to the event section and find an event and go to the participants section here, you'll see right here, they can come in and run that report that they just created themselves. Uh, what did I call that report? They call it demo participant. Is that it? Yes. Demo, thank you. Um, and they can come in and then that report is automatically generated for them with it. And like Kevin said, it was so, so here it is. What Kevin said about it being so liberating and so freeing between, we use monkey bread. Um, I, he, it's great documentation. It was really well documented for us, but the freeing aspect of us not having to do minuscule things and they can get into such depth of report building. So if I'm on this order one, which was the first one I did, they can come in here and they can add in additional headers. So header fields at the top and I want it to be at A1. And we'll make this one bold and we'll center that one. And then we'll add to the second one. And we'll just do that one plain text and left. And you can see also in these column headers, there is one that was by amount. And they have the ability to format that number in a bunch of different ways, depending on what it was, because we know in the back end that that's a number field. And I'll get into the mechanics of how that works, but now they've just changed the report, added to the report, done whatever they want. And now when they come over here to run that report on online items, they have those additional headers already built in or whatever they want to feed. They, they're in control of their own reports at this point. So, and now you can see that those new items are in the header. So they have control over what they want, how they want them formatted. Um, really the sky's the limit. And like Kevin had mentioned earlier, they can do anything you can do in Excel, you can build in through the, I call it Live Excel. He calls it, I, I, I think his pronunciation is probably better based on the, it's based on library. So I may have to start changing my context to that, but it allows them to build whatever it wants. And the mechanics of it are, are really straightforward. Um, so when they're building that report, what they are building is 
here's here's the report, here's that order list one, here's just the back end of it, right? And when the script calls it, there is also two other things that go into this. There is a report, field assigned, and then a report field. Let me get to the report field first. So this, based on their context that they select for the ending of the report, this, so when I was in participant, these are all the fields that I could select for participant. These are my merge tags that merges it in. So I had the option to select any of these fields. And so this is what we do on the back end, right? We build this table on the back end. They're not building this table. We're building this form. We have all the different types of default settings. They can modify any of these. Um, and then this is the selector name. This is the merge tag that gets put in. This is the default header. They can change any of their header columns that they want um, to anything that they want as well. And so this, this is their list of fields. It then, when they select it, it creates a report field assign where I have the report field ID from this table and the report ID. And all it does then when it goes and runs it, it's, it finds the report. It's all done on server, no, not taking away their time. And it gathers up the report field assigned as JSON. And I just got it here beforehand. But you can see it gives all those parameters that LibXL needs to generate the report and then it just finds all the data because I know that I know the starting point of that data. It was on event and it ended on participants. So I know how to control getting to those records. And then at that point it goes through and then what it's the key is is the merge field is this merge field. And when it gets to when it's writing out each of those data points, it uses a custom function that again we're building this custom function for the client to give them the flexibility, but it's this export substitute. And you can see in here, so if I was at the context of event and that merge tag was past the context in the merge tag, hey, I'm at the context of event and the merge tag is event number, I know that this is my path. If I'm at the context of event and I'm adding the seminar coordinator's name, well, I know this is my path to get that, that data. And so it's just running through basically what Kevin did, but it's doing it with a little bit more abstraction to allow our customers the flexibility to modify the reports, build the reports, add the reports. We, we build the underlying structure to allow them to build them how they want. Questions on that report builder? That looks pretty, uh, it pretty seems, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, it is sweet. It seems like a lot of investment. Um, so it's really one of those things that is built over time. Like the custom function, we started with only reporting from event based, right? And so I only had. In this report field, uh, we'll get rid of this one because that one just is created. All I had was participants because that's all that we were reporting on initially. And then we add more context. They started wanting to do order line items and that. Building these records are pretty simple. Once the structure is built up, it has not been as labor intensive as I had actually imagined it was going to be when we first started going down this path. And they have built, I don't even know how many reports they've built. They, it's far less work, I can tell you this, than building all the reports that they have asked, that they've built themselves. Well, I can believe that. So they're finding it flexible enough. Oh, yeah, they, they build, they have ridiculous amount of reports. So. And, and I think too, Chris, one of the things that's been helpful with that process and building that out is 
then being able to use that same methodology for other clients. So yes. for one, like being able to kind of do that for the next and the next and the next um, and the benefit there um, and that everyone, everyone else has benefited since then um, from, from the work that you've started there. Yeah. Yeah. A little over a year, there are over 50 reports that they've developed on their own without us having to do nothing. And I would say from at least the ones that I've gone through and run during testing and training, I mean, they have reports that are some of them 25, 30 fields wide, um, all formatted and um, especially on the event side of things, on their event, the event side of their business, um, they really utilize the headers and um, the summation uh, feature that Chris has in the bottom of there. So they can kind of do all their sums and totals as well. Um, that they're able to distribute to their trainers and the different people that need that information as well. Nothing close to the hundred of spreadsheets they used to use to run their business, but the ones that they have now are very powerful. Any other questions? Chris, was there anything else you wanted to um, get out under the hood? Um, I was just looking at the list here. Yeah, I'm looking at the list here. One of the cooler well, things I'm... about... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead. No, I'm going to leave time for questions. We're, we're good. I don't have to... Um, I was going to ask Charles um, if you want if we wanted to look at um, FM Better Forms and evaluate it for our own use case. How would we get started? Yeah, the first thing is to do is to book a demo, and the reason for that is um, in our demo we're super generous with time, right? So we'll typically take hour, hour and a half, you know, because you want to show us your solution and what you're doing so far, and, and so so on. So it's not an in and out type of thing. And quite often what we'll do is during a demo as well, well, almost all the time, we'll book, we'll build a live build a proof of concept. Won't be with your connected to your database. I got a development database that's kind of a random tables and such. And we'll prove that you can, hey, this is what you want to build. I want to build this um, authorization process or something like that mm -hmm. or, or payment widget. And we'll build that out. So they can, um, you can book a demo at www.fmbetterforms.com. There's a, big blue button on the front, on the, on the landing page there. Incidentally, that page was built into FM Better Forms as well. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, I just, just a couple of things to add on to what Chris was doing. Cause I, I know Chris, I've worked with Chris now, I guess for, well, I guess you guys probably about six, seven years, maybe more over the maybe years. The hoop, the hoop group one goes back, predates better forms. So yeah. 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 And, and um, that methodology, the, the, you know, abstract things and, and make things flexible or dynamic through whatever indirection or, or whatever the techniques are you're using. That is actually how we got started. Right. We, we said, well, you know what, we're building these kind of dynamic interfaces in the web and um, let's make these very, very flexible and pass that, that flexibility on to the developer. And that's uh, that's originally how uh, FM Better Forms started uh, um, six plus years ago. We actually, oddly enough, just kind of quick fun fact, our very first two paying customers were on this call today, which is uh, just a quick shout out to Kevin Frank and uh, Paul Jensen. So they, they they gave us a bit of a kick back in 20, I don't know, 17 or something like that to say, hey, release this as a product when we did a, a demo. So thank you guys. We're very appreciative of that because our team has grown a lot since then. And we have hundreds of apps that are running on the network now. But uh, yeah, that's the best way to get started, honestly, is to see what, you know, start to think, start to think about what your use case is. And a couple of things, just a couple of quick caveats is a lot of times, you know, we, we build stuff for our clients and we build it and we're just, we're off and we quote them, I don't know, it's 50, 100, 500, whatever hours it is, and we build it and then you leave. Um, what I try to encourage people to do now is to try to start looking and building these uh, interfaces. And maybe even you know throwing a third option on your on your quotes and saying, hey, um, here's here's you know if we build it this way, it's cost this much, and we build it this way, it's cost much this much. But if we build it 
as a app as a service where you know maybe you'll reduce the initial amount and charge your clients so much you end up starting to build recurring revenue and we're seeing uh, a number of developers have really good success with that um, we encourage it uh, as, as far as our, our platform goes as well so that's just something just food for thought but uh, something to think about too thank you thank you i want to i want to um, just i want to just chime okay. in for a second also uh you guys know us uh we were dabbling in f and better forms a couple of years ago and we've got multiple projects right now that have been highly successful with it charles and his team have been fantastic and uh it's a really good sweet spot uh between again what 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 you get with sort of the baked in uh, skill set of, of web direct versus full stack development and so forth. So uh, we couldn't be more pleased than, than what we've seen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know what it's, it's, you say, that, but it's, it's Andrew, Andrew's uh, like our superstar. So he's, uh, he's your main point of contact for, for both of you guys and uh, everybody on the team is great, but uh, we give it accolades to him. I yeah. concur. Andrew is awesome. Thank you. Yes. There's no doubt about that. that he probably dreads my Slack message when he says, can we just maybe look at doing one more thing? Can we add this feature? Can you do this? He's like, oh, yeah, we can figure it out. Fair enough. Uh, next day. Feature free. I mean, it's solvable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Are there any other questions, technical or otherwise, about this presentation, which... I thought it was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much to all of you who showed the the innermost guts of your of your program and really appreciated seeing all of it. And I hope we get some demos booked for you. Um, Rosemary uh, said that she had a short announcement before we quit. Yeah, are you there, Rosemary? I'm here. Thanks. Yay. So just a couple of things about Claris Engage. Um, we are nearly sold out. So if you're still on the fence, act soon um, if you want to come to Austin. And second, everyone who has already registered should have received an email inviting you to the app for building your schedule this week. And I know I've heard from a handful of people that they did not. We are troubleshooting that problem right now. Um, and we'll hopefully have instructions early next week for how you can get into that app. But if you did not receive that in, in invitation or if you had any problems with it, please send email to engage2024 at claris.com so we can make sure that you can get registered. Um, and I think the subject was something along the lines of build your Claris Engage schedule and it may have hit your inbox appearing to be from you. So I know Stephen Blackwell reached out and said, this looks suspicious, is it legitimate? Um, so if you ignored it because you thought it was suspicious, it, it wasn't suspicious, it, it is legitimate. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Um, a note that we will not be here in February. We'll see you on the second Friday in March. I believe Chris Moyer is handling that meeting. So if you have any content, please contact him. And thank you so much to Kevin Frank, all the people from FM Better Forms and NaviQ who are here to present to us. We had a great meeting. So we'll see you in March or at Engage for those who are going. So thank you very much.